So today we're going to be continuing our discussion on boosters, but this time instead of looking at a transistor-based boost pedal, we're going to be looking at an op-amp-based boost pedal. Because a boost pedal is simply amplifying the signal, a boost pedal can be made from any kind of amplification element, whether it be a transistor or an op-amp or a tube or um, a digital signal processor, anything that can make our signal louder could be used as a booster. But the op-amp is um, something that is used all over in guitar effects, and so I thought it would be useful to look at one of the most common op-amp boosters, the uh, MXR Microamp. This design has been around for decades, and it works uh, pretty well. So here's our schematic. And we're, again, just going to start at our input and just kind of work our way through. Here we have R1, which as we talked about last time, is our pull-down resistor. But you'll notice that this one has a very large value of 22 megaohms. And um, part of the reason for that is that because this circuit is so old, this was long before there were any kind of established norms or anything. And so some of the values that we see um, could be changed with very little effect. Again, we have an input capacitor, C1. The 100 nanofarads is a very common value for guitar effects. If you were using something that um, might have a lot of low frequency content in it, then you might want to consider making that a little bigger. But um, 100 nanofarads for guitar is considered very super standard. And again, his job is to block any incoming DC signal, and it also provides some filtering. Um, next, we come up to this point right here, and I think it's important for us to just identify what the audio path is here. Our audio path is going to be all of this, okay? Um, so as I'm talking about the signal path, this is the area that we're going to be concentrating on, but it is important to um, be aware of, obviously, this resistor here connected to a reference voltage. This is for biasing the op amp because we are feeding the op amp with plus nine volts here and ground here, which means that we want to bias the op amp to the midpoint so that we have, if we bias it to four and a half volts, we have four and a half volts on the positive side for our signal to swing to, and four and a half volts on the negative side for our signal to swing to. If we didn't bias this op amp, then what would happen is when we had a big um, negative voltage swing, the negative side of the signal would, um, it's called railing out, um, uh, with an op amp, it means that the signal would go so low that the op amp couldn't track with it. And so we would get nastiness for our signal. Um, so that bias voltage comes through this 10 mega ohm resistor, and then it also goes through this 1K resistor. Um, and then we come to this op amp. And this op amp is set up as a non-inverting op amp stage you see the little plus and minus on the op amp here and you can set up an op amp so that the signal coming out of it is inverted relative to the input or non-inverted relative to the input meaning we did not flip the phase 180 degrees or we didn't put it out of phase so we come in on the plus terminal that means that we're going to be doing a non-inverting gain stage and we have this feedback path here from the output to the negative input. The purpose of this feedback path is to feed some of the output signal back into the negative terminal. And what happens is when we do that, it changes the gain characteristics of the op amp. And we're not going to get really heavily into it here. Uh, I've put a, a link down below in the description about non-inverting op amp stages. You're welcome to go read more if you like. But the important things to note with a non-inverting 
op amp stage is that the gain is set by the ratio between the impedance in the feedback loop and the impedance that goes to ground from the negative terminal. Now you see here that we've got a resistor and a capacitor here. We've got a potentiometer, a resistor, and a capacitor here. When we talk about impedance, we are talking about the combination of resistance and capacitance and inductance. They all have different equations for what their impedance is. And impedance is what makes the magic happen in our effects. So the ratio between what is happening here and what is happening here is really, really important. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. By and large, the primary, um, well, the, the, the um, DC gain, if you will, of our op amp stage is going to be the ratio of the resistances in these two sections. Okay, So we have a fixed 56 kilo ohm resistance in the feedback path, but then we actually change the amount of gain that the op amp is providing with our gain potentiometer. This resistor R6 exists solely to provide a minimum amount of resistance coming from the negative terminal to ground. If this wasn't there and we were to set R5 so that it was no resistance whatsoever, this would go into what's called open loop and it would the op amp would try and provide as much gain as it possibly can and it's going to go into instability and all kinds of bad things will happen to your signal. So having R6 here sets the minimum amount of uh, resistance or the maximum amount of gain that you're going to get out of your op amp. If we were to make this bigger, then the maximum amount of gain that our op amp could provide would be less. Um, and again, that would all be determined by the ratio of R4 to R6. Um, the value of the potentiometer, however, sets the minimum amount of gain that we're going to have. So with a 500 kilo ohm pot here, um, that's a pretty big value. If we were to reduce this value, then that means that when we turn our boost knob or our level knob all the way down, our gain would still be larger than if we were to turn the 500K all the way down. Now the other thing we'll see here that we should talk about are these two capacitors. We have C2 right there and we have C3 right here. The impedance that, that a capacitor presents is frequency dependent and it is really high impedance at low frequencies and really low impedance at high frequencies, meaning it lets higher frequencies through while blocking DC and very low frequencies. So with C2 being a very small value, it is blocking the vast majority of low frequencies and it's really only letting high frequencies through. And by letting these high frequencies through in our feedback path, it actually causes there to be a little bit less gain at those really high frequencies. Now, with 47 picofarads, those frequencies are going to be really high, a lot of them in the ultrasonic range, um, possibly even up into the RF range. And so a very small value capacitor in the feedback path is just to provide high frequency stability for um, the op amp gain stage. Now C3 is a is showing some impedance from our negative or our um, inverting terminal of the op amp to ground. What that means is that it is letting it is letting um, some of the higher frequencies bleed off to ground here which means that it is a smaller resistance for high frequencies. 
and a smaller resistance here is going to increase the gain. Now we're not so much concerned about the increase of the gain at high frequencies, but rather the fact that it rolls off the low frequencies. It's a very high impedance path, path for the low frequencies. So this actually acts a little bit more like not allowing the base frequencies to get super, super amplified so that if we have anything that's really low in frequency, we're not gaining it up super high. When we gain up low frequencies a lot, we can begin to, um, we can begin to saturate the op amp or we can rail out the op amp because low frequencies can carry so much energy with them. So by providing a very high impedance to the really low frequencies here, we are preventing excess bassiness from going on in the gain that our op amp is providing. And then finally, at the output end of our circuit here, we have a DC blocking cap for our output capacitor. You notice that 15 microfarads is really large. It doesn't really need to be this large. This is another one of those um, values that were determined a long time ago that now that we've been playing guitars for with effects for decades and decades, you really don't need anything this large. You can get away with one microfarad probably just fine or even possibly as small as 100 nanofarads, but that's certainly something that you can adjust to taste there. And then following that DC blocking cap, we've got R9 and R10 here, which form a voltage divider. But you'll notice that R9 is very small compared to R10. And so we're not really dividing the voltage down really at all. More than anything, R10 is working as a pull-down resistor, and um, R9 is just providing some series resistance to make sure that uh, we're not pulling down too fast. Alternatively, what you could do is you could either make R9 smaller or eliminate it completely and make R10 larger. If I were doing, if I were designing this, I would just make R10 be um, a one mega ohm resistor and I'd get rid of R9. But this is the way the circuit was designed. So that's the entire audio path. We're going to look at the power section here because it's a little bit more complex than the power section um, that we looked at in the transistor stage, but not by too much. There's our power section and again we have this polarity protection diode. It's a shock key diode um, so that we're not losing a lot of voltage going through it and also so that it protects us from reverse polarity um, conditions. And then we have C6, which is our um, filtering capacitor for our 9 volt line. Okay, Does the same thing as in the previous circuit where it helps get rid of any ripple or noise that might be on our power supply and creates a little reservoir of, of charge for our 9 volt line. But then we also see that we have R7 and R8 here, and they are creating a resistor divider. And this resistor divider is to provide that bias voltage that the op amp needs. Because these are equal value resistors, the voltage at this point is going to be one half the voltage up here, which is nine volts. And as mentioned before, when we bias the op amp, we want to bias it to the midpoint of the op amps supply voltages, which are nine volts and ground in this case. And then once we have that voltage, we put in a capacitor here that is going to do much the same thing as C6 does. It's going to provide a little bit of a reservoir of charge to help keep the VREF stable. Um, it also will help a little bit if there's any kind of noise in the power supply, but that's not as big a concern as the concern of how much current gets drawn out of here. Because if we were to, um, you know, feed in a really huge signal into our op amp, there's a chance that we may need a little more current from our bias voltage or from our reference voltage. And so this capacitor helps to just have a little bit of a reservoir there to 
keep it from uh, from dropping too low. Okay. Um, and then finally, we have R2 here, which we talked about a little bit earlier. This is um, this is the resistor through which our uh, reference voltage goes to bias the op amp. It's really large in this case to prevent there being any kind of a way for our audio signal to come up this way. Um, we really don't want our audio coming back in into the other side of R2 here because there are potential paths for ground for it to get to ground here um, through this 100k resistor which may very well provide less of an impedance path to our signal than the impedance coming into our op amp. So we want to make sure that our audio signal is going into the op amp thus we have a large value for R2 to prevent our audio signal from getting up into our power section. Now there are lots of ways that we can configure an op amp for um, gain, for being a gain stage, but I've only talked about this one here because the microamp is a great case study in a simple non-inverting gain stage and um, this will be a building block that you will come across in lots of different pedals. Um, op amps get used for buffers um, or very small gain stages in a lot of pedals, um, especially pedals where you have a combination of clean and affected signal like a delay or a reverb. You're always going to have some kind of a of a buffer up front that is likely going to be op amp based for splitting that signal. So this is a great kind of introduction into these op amp gain stages. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please subscribe so you'll be notified when the next one comes and we'll see you then. Thanks.